If we tap now a little bit into the actual discussions around uh, funds and funds regulation, uh, we have seen in the past that there have been a lot of critical sounding in the market in terms of still having funds not regulated, if we speak, for example, about hedge funds. Um, therefore, the usage uh, for the regulative uh, that directive has been, has been launched. Yeah, my question will be maybe first here uh, to the uh, participants on, on the table. Uh, will the new directive uh, usage for facilitate from your point of view even more investors and especially Sharia compliant investors into Malta or do you see any difficulties uh, with regards to more regulation and more, more uh, reports and more, more uh, common, common uh, regulations? To connect to what uh, um, the previous speaker has said, yes, please. Mm -hmm. the USIT's orientation is transferable securities and they are you know, shares and bonds and collective investment schemes and so on. So to the extent that it is, it is mandatory that those kind of issues, those kind of instruments only can be held by USIT, you have a restriction which doesn't necessarily apply in the context of the Sharia investments. On the other hand, um, you find that there are very flexible and interesting investments which a Sharia compliant fund can make, which mm -hmm. would be a pity to disregard, which cannot be fitted in within the usage. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, going forward, what we're going to find is with usage for becoming a bit more open, the likelihood is that we're going to be able to combine possibly more investments into the usage. So I think it will be a good thing even in this context. And the advantage is that it gives even to a conventional investor, you know, I mean, could be then easily applied to a Sharia compliant investor in the sense of enhanced protection, you know, disclosure. So I think it, it, will, it will help, yes. I mean, I don't think, uh, mm. I, I think that, that would be the direction, you know. And again, uh, the fact that, you know, uh, the cross-border distribution, you know, the simplification would, uh, would definitely help, and again, uh, you know, it's the same the same argument that we've we've been bringing uh, throughout, which is uh, if we had to look at it on a jurisdiction basis, you know, on a jurisdictional basis, uh, it's it's what Malta can offer then, because the product will be the same throughout. So it's more as to what it can offer uh, in terms of in terms of advantages to promoters or managers seeking uh, a jurisdiction where to domicile the Sharia compliant fund, and I think that is where. Uh, the promotion should be taking place uh, in Malta and internationally, even from a Maltese perspective, because I believe that more needs to be done to put Malta on the map uh, internationally in this respect. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what is your experience in, uh, from out of Germany, uh, Dr. Dr. Litten, uh, in terms of uh, yeah, structuring it for, for what kind of investors? Is it more than... Uh, driven by, by having it on, on the European side and placing it there for these investors or are the investors more coming from, from other regions of, of the world? I, I think it is fair to say that recent experience in Germany with trying to attract the local population, the local, local investors to Islamic funds has not been a success story. There is, of course, an element in the German market that has to be taken into consideration. That is that 10, 7, 8 years ago, there was a big fraud case where especially the, uh, the Turkish population, people were selling fraudlessly uh, Islamic products to the Turkish population. Uh, and, um, and, and that is obviously uh, a burden that the market still has to deal with. So um, the retail market in German, Germany for Islamic asset finance products is, is suffering. It is not working as well as it could be. Uh, there will be additional additional efforts necessary to uh, make people forget this bad experience in the past. So my answer to the question would be that I would put more emphasis on the professional investors, whether they come from Europe 
or from the GCC countries is, is difficult to say, but I would feel that it should be attractive for investors from GCC countries to invest in funds uh, that have German assets. Maybe just to add to this comment, since uh, we have seen some initiatives, as uh, Dr. Litten mentioned in Germany, uh, when we structure products for institutional clients, it's automatically then linked to investors in the Middle East, since uh, it's, it's, it's actually then already addressed to that part. And when we speak about structuring um, retail products and usage is actually then more than uh, protection for retail clients, then you of course speak about the local clients in that area. So if a fund is launched in Luxembourg and the institution is sitting in Germany, then of course for the German retail market. The experience, as uh, Dr. Litten mentioned, have not been that good. There is still the question and the hot discussion, uh, is there an appetite or not? Some of them say no, we have launched products. Some of them say yes, we have 4.6 million retail clients, Muslims, without non-Muslims who are also interested in that product. Uh, what we have experienced, but this is a view from, from, from us as an institute, the, the bottleneck and the gap is in the distribution. If an institution thinks that they can sell products on the shelf as conventional ones, and especially in Germany, they're not promoting it with marketing quite, quite heavily, uh, that makes it quite difficult. If you distribute uh, Sharia-compliant products, then you have to know the local community. So you have to go to communities, sometimes even to communities of mosques. If we have 70% Turkish people, you have to cooperate with the Turkish community. And this is a step that uh, a lot of institutions, um, I'm quite sure they know it, but still don't want to go it. And then, of course, the gap exists. But this is only our perspective, what we see. I mean, Mr. Uh, Dr. Litten or uh, Herr Dr. Martin Bartels maybe can, can confirm that, but we see a lack in the distribution channels, and uh, this is the issue. There is one asset which we should not over, uh, um, oversee. Uh, beyond the investors who may uh, come from um, continental Europe or from the GCC countries, there is one more aspect which is quite important, it is portfolio management. And I do believe that German Muslims um, trust German portfolio managers more than Turkish portfolio managers in general. They are traditional clients of the um, savings banks and of the cooperative sector. And they are living here for many, many years already. They are essentially Germans. So clearly there is a capital of, um, of trust which has built up over the years. And there is, has been, as Dr. Litton pointed out, a destruction of trust in Turkish asset management um, capabilities because of the scandal. I, I believe that more than 2 billion euros have vanished in that black hole. That, of course, has um, entailed quite some collateral damage. It's a black hole. Nobody knows how much disappeared there. But when you speak to Turks, they're all traumatized. Okay. I think uh, Dr. Ganado still had that. You've got um, usage which came in in order to create a stronger protection for investors and uh, a more serious wrapper around the fund. And uh, Sharia, I think, also is a a wrapper, you can say, which opens up a product for a certain type of investor. Now, what's happening is that as uses become more uh, accepted, they will start becoming the eligibility criteria for investors of another type, for instance, like insurance companies or banks or, or whatever in terms of balance sheet eligibility and so on. So as you start seeing uh, this product having two wrappers, in other words, open to Islamic investors, but then having the eligibility for certain investors to come in. It doesn't mean it has to be in Europe or it has to be, you know, in, in the Far East or anything. It's an issue of eligibility to the particular investor. Mm -hmm. And the more boxes you tick in terms of it being okay for these investors to take it, the more you're going to have potential for sales. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I would then lead the uh, next part in terms of conclusion to uh, Ruben Butija. 
I would first before thank to the uh, panel participants here, Dr. Ganado and uh, Dr. David Zara, and of course to our participants sitting in Frankfurt, uh, Dr. Rüdiger Litten from Norton Rose and uh, Dr. Hermann Bartels. Thank you for you. Uh, thank you for participating, and uh, hopefully next time seeing you here physically in Malta. Thank you. Thank you, Nusif. Uh, just a few, a few words. Uh, I think it's been a very interesting and enlightening session, particularly our, on the opportunities there and the weaknesses there we might have in terms of visibility and, and marketing of Malta. Uh, I think Alberto has given a little bit too much details on what he is doing, uh, but uh, he was obviously conscious of the audience he had in front of him. I'd like to thank a lot Munsif for his uh, coming over here to Malta again to, to chair this, this session and for his contribution to Malta in, in general. We'll be having him back here possibly in November for the Mediterranean Economic Forum. Uh, thanks to all the panelists. Uh, thanks to the staff of Finance, Malta and the Institute of Management for organizing uh, this, this event. Hope it has been fruitful for all of you and we'll hope to see uh, some more uh, marketing from all the firms present here to attract as much Islamic funds as we can to Malta. Thanks to all and hope to see you at the other events of the Institute and Finance Malta. Thank you. Thank you.